Hello! Today I want to show you a rather interesting oddity, and this relates to the Amiga computers from the 80s and 90s. Back in the day, software and games came on floppy disks. For example, this is an 8 inch floppy disk. And this one here, this is a 5 and a quarter inch disk. And this one here, this is a 3 and a half inch disk, and no, I haven't printed the save icon. Now, the 3 and a half inch disks also came in several capacities, this one being a double density disk, and on an Amiga, that would have held around 880k of data. This one here, a high density disk, around 1.76 megabytes. Now most Amigas only came with the drive capable of reading double density disks, with the exception of some Amiga 3000 and 4000s, and some external drives. So today, we're going to take a look at some of those external drives, and one of them is not like the others. What you can see right now are three external floppy drives. The one on the left is a standard double density drive, however the right two both support high density disks, but the way they achieve this is actually very different. You see, when the custom chips were designed for the Amiga, Paula, the chip that reads and writes data to the floppy drive, among other things, could only read and write at two different speeds. One speed was for the five and a quarter inch disks that were rarely used on the Amiga, and a faster speed for the double density three and a half inch disks. When the Amiga was first released in 1985, high density disks didn't actually exist until 1987. So the problem here is that when data is received from the floppy drive, Paula has some special logic called a PLL, or phased lock loop, that locks onto the incoming data at a fixed rate, allowing a small margin of error in case of slightly different drive speeds. That data for a double density disk will typically come between 4, 6 and 8 microseconds apart, so Paula will attempt to clock this data in, synchronised at around 2 microsecond intervals. Then it spits that data into RAM using DMA. If you want to know more about how the encoding on a floppy disk works, then you can watch this rather old video of mine. All was good so far, and this worked perfectly. However, when high density disks came out, they fitted twice the amount of data in the same space, by shrinking those intervals to 2, 3 and 4 microseconds. But as Paula could only handle the lower data rate being used by double density disks being a physical hardware constraint, it couldn't decode the high density data. And sadly, in the entire lifetime of the Amiga, that chip was never updated. So how did Commodore finally get a high density drive working? Well, they cheated. They had a special version of the floppy drive made, the Chinon FZ357A, such that when a double density disk was inserted, it behaved normally, spinning at 300 RPM. But if you inserted a high density disk, the drive would detect this and switch to spinning at half the speed, 150 RPM, slowing down the data from the disk so it was received at the same speed as a double density disk. And by a special combination of motor signals and drive selection, the Amiga could read a special drive ID sequence back from the ready line to detect the type of disk that was inserted, so it knew to expect more data. Now, I don't actually have a Chinon FZ357A, they're fairly expensive to get hold of these days, but let's have a look at the two high density drives that I do actually have, and spoiler, one of them is totally not like the other. This one, in a 3D printed case, is actually a modified PC drive to work with the Amiga, and it's modded to behave exactly like the Commodore drive. If a double density disk is inserted, it will spin at 300 RPM, and if a high density one is inserted, it will spin at 150. The circuit at the back tells the Amiga which type of disk is inserted by producing the correct drive ID sequence when requested. I've created this rather crazy disk with a pattern on it. Anyone that owned a record player might recognise this type of disc. Those lines are designed so that if I flash a strobe light at it at exactly 50 Hz, or if I record at exactly 50 frames per second, the lines should appear as if they aren't moving. So I've connected the drive up to my Amiga 1200, and you should be able to see the difference. Firstly, I'll load Amiga Test Kit and we'll get to the options. This disc is currently set up to report as a double density disc, and you can see that the drive ID is reported as all zeros. Now if I start the disc spinning, firstly you can see this number here, the period. That's how long it takes for the disc to rotate, and it should ideally be 200 milliseconds, or 300 RPM. There's a magnetic sensor on the drive that pulses once a second for every rotation, and this is what's being watched for to calculate this. Now I'm just going to cut to some footage here showing a double density disc spinning connected to an oscilloscope. 
The signal is inverted to make it easier to understand, and it's connected to the index pin, which is the one that gets signal once per revolution. And as you can see, the width between the pulses is around 200 milliseconds, as we'd expect. So going back to our pattern disk, and if I change the shutter speed on the camera to be a multiple of 50, you can see the lines more or less freeze in place. The slight drift is because it doesn't actually spin exactly the right speed, but it's close enough. I'll now take the disc out and hack the corner so it becomes a high density disc and reinsert it. And as you can see, it's now detected as all A's. That's the 1010 etc pattern, which means a high density disc is inserted. And if I start the disc spinning, you'll notice this time the period has changed to 399 milliseconds, which is around 150 RPM, half the speed. Now cutting back to the oscilloscope view again, and you can now see the width has changed to 400 milliseconds, more or less what the Amiga test kit was showing. So everything's behaving as we'd expect it. And now we go back to the crazy disc with the lines on it, because at the half the speed, the lines stay in view longer of the camera, and so the result is they look darker. I'll put the two recordings side by side for you to compare, and you can really see the difference. So that's the hack that Commodore used to implement it. Sure it worked okay, is a bit of a bodge, and it required a special floppy drive. Firstly, with this ability to switch speeds, and secondly, to produce this special drive ID pattern. The special model, the Chinon FZ357A, was quite expensive, and came with some Amiga 3000s and 4000s, and as a result, to this day, they're actually quite rare. And all this, because that poor Paula chip never once got updated. So anyway, what about this other drive? Well, this one took a little bit of a different approach, but before we look at that, I just want to give a quick shout out to my Patreon supporters, and I'm really grateful for their support. And if you'd like to support me, catch my videos early, or see the extra bits behind the scenes, then check out the links in the video description. So, this is the other drive I have. It's the Power Computing XL, and from the outside it looks the same as any other floppy drive. But looks can be deceiving. Here's a review of the drive from Amazing Computing for the Commodore Amiga, Volume 9 from August of 1994, explaining what it is, how it works, and if you look closely, you can see that a special workbench driver is also included. However, this driver is only required for writing to disks. Now looking at a few other computer magazines from around the same time, this being Amiga Computing, issue 90 from 1995, we can see that this drive retailed at $79.95, with the internal options also being available. Interestingly, they also sold a Super version too. Now, a year later on, in the same magazine, issue 101, the price has dropped by £10 to $69.95. I wonder if this was to get rid of old stock. Mind you, this was two years after Commodore went bankrupt anyway. This is a really bad photo of what the internal drive looked like, so you can see there's some extra circuitry hanging out of the back of the drive. Now, that's not entirely surprising, my other high density drive also had some, but also, if you look inside a normal external floppy drive, you can see that it has some chips as well. These are mostly to do with latching the motor on inside the drive when requested, and this one being a double density drive wouldn't need to do anything else. Time to test it out, and I've installed the driver on my Amiga 1200, and I've got the drive connected up, so let's take a look. First, I'll insert a double density disk, and Workbench can see it fine. You can see that if I try to format it, it tells us the capacity is 880k. Now I'll insert a high density disk. This one has been formatted and files copied to it, and again it appears as a normal disk. And as you can see, if I attempt to format it, the capacity is shown as 1760k, as we'd expect. So let's load the Amiga test kit and see what it makes of it. Once again, with a double density disk, you can see that the drive ID is detected as all zeros again. Now heading to the signal test, and once the motor is enabled, we can see we get a period of around 200 milliseconds, which again is around 300 RPM, just like we'd expect. Now let's have a look at a high density disk. Just like with the other drive, we get a drive ID with all A's. So let's have a look at the signal test. Well, straight away something here is a little different, we're getting index pulses detected and the motor isn't even running. What's more, that period is all over the place, ranging between 300 and 500 milliseconds. That would be a theoretical speed of 120 to 200 RPM. These are obviously not real, they can't be real, the disc isn't even spinning. So let's start it spinning and see what happens. Okay, it's settled around 400 milliseconds. That's our 150 RPM, except it doesn't sound any different. So I suspect this is a simulated lie. 
So there's clearly something fishy going on here. I couldn't hear any difference between the disc spinning for double density or high density. It sounded the same. So what's going on here? Well, let's open it up and take a look inside. It only takes a moment to open with four screws on the bottom and the whole thing slides out to reveal a floppy drive and a PCB. Clearly, there's some extra magic going on here. Looking at the PCB again and looking at the chips, well, we have a GAL here. This is a programmable chip that can be used to provide some basic logic and they're quite cheap. My guess is it's probably used to generate the drive ID sequence and some of the basic logic. Next to it, we have a RAM chip. This contains 256K 4-bit words or around 128 kilobytes of RAM. Finally, we have this big square chip. Now, this drive isn't mine, so I'm not gonna be peeling off that label, but with a bit of Googling, I can discover it's a Texas Instruments TPC 1010AFN-068C, a CMOS field programmable gate array, or FPGA. However, this is a really old chip and it's non-volatile, remembering its configuration after powering off, and it can only be programmed once. Next to it is a 16 megahertz crystal, no doubt providing a clock to that FPGA. So what about the floppy drive? Well, for all intents and purposes, this is a normal floppy drive, except that its pin configuration is for a sugar drive and not a PC drive. But there's two other oddities I've noticed. First, pin four, which on a sugar drive is typically used for the in-use pin, is actually being used to output a signal if the inserted disc is a high density or double density disc. There must have been a special modification for this, but there's no sign that any of this board has been messed with. And secondly, the floppy drive connector on this board is actually mounted upside down. You can see how it was keyed on the motherboard, but it wasn't inserted that way around. Most likely ordered from the factory like this. And this may relate to the specific version of this drive. I thought I'd hook this one up to the oscilloscope too, like I did with the first one. This currently has a double density disc inserted. The top trace, in yellow, is the index line reported directly from the drive. The bottom trace is what the circuit is sending to the Amiga as the index drive, and currently they're identical, sitting at that magic 200 milliseconds interval. Now, watch what happens when I insert a high density disc. Aside from getting pulses before I even started the motor, which happens to be 400 milliseconds apart, once started, the top trace remains at that original 200 millisecond interval, proving the disc is still being spun at 300 RPM. But the bottom trace, the one being sent to the Amiga, aside from being all over the place, clearly the pulses are twice as far apart at around 400 milliseconds, pretending to be that 150 RPM signal. So how does this drive work then? To find out, I reached out to the creator of both the hardware and the software, Adam Hill, and he kindly explained a number of different things. Firstly, we got talking about how this drive got developed, and he responded with this very interesting message. Before I created this, I had meetings with Sony and David Pleasance, and basically said, can't you just run the drive at half speed? To which the answer was no. But annoyingly, that's pretty much what they actually did when the official high density drives came out a couple of years later. I'll have to ask David about that next time I see him. See if he remembers that meeting, and if it's where Commodore got the idea from. Anyway, Next, I wanted to know about the custom floppy drive that seems to have been used, especially with pin 4 being used to signal the type of disk inserted. And he replied with, When you ordered the drive hardware, if you ordered enough, you could specify many options, including the use of specific pins. The options were controlled by surface mount zero ohm resistors placed at strategic points on the PCB. So the actual pin configuration isn't that relevant in terms of the specific drive model, although the 22 model may reflect the options in use. There wasn't anything particularly special about the drives themselves, just the availability of the options we wanted. I think the pinouts were chosen to match the standard density drives we used. So that explains the drive, and with such a small modification, I suspect it probably made these drives cheaper to make than the changes required by Commodore to spin the drive slower. Anyway, then I decided to have a guess at how it worked, and I was only partially right. And he explained that, the hardware consisted of a 256 kilobit DRAM and a programmable logic gate or two. I didn't decode the data at all, I just sampled it and wrote the stream directly to the DRAM. Another part of the circuit read it back out at half speed. For reading, that's fine. The DRAM forms a circular buffer and has enough space to store the data of a single track more than twice. Now, keeping that pre-read data in sync with what the Amiga saw would have been interesting. And he said, there's a sync pulse that the drive emits on every rotation of the disc. 
That was used as a way to sync up the read process. The disc controller on the Amiga was made to start reading at the same time as the DRAM was reset to the start for both the read and the write. And that makes perfect sense. It would easily be able to transmit a recording of the disc at a slower speed back to the Amiga. Thus, it simulated the slower rotational speed using the RAM rather than the physical change. Writing back, however, now that would be more tricky. And I asked him about that, and he said, the write process is basically the same bit in reverse. The sync pulse had to be used to start writing data to the disc. I think the main thing was starting the actual write process after the Amiga sends enough data over half a track so that the real write didn't run out. This could have been done in hardware also, but we were trying to keep it as cheap as possible. And that's not all. The driver also performed one more interesting feature. The other thing which made things massively faster, even with the standard drive, was that it acted as a cache for both read and write operations. So there you have it. Essentially, all the magic happens by buffering up the data being read from and written to the drive, to compensate for the speed difference, making the Amiga think that it's still running at double density speeds. Seems really obvious now when I think about it. The only reason I can think for doing this is it must have been cheaper than the modifications Commodore used, although maybe it was slightly less reliable and relying on the driver for writing too. I'd be really interested to know if how much back then a high density drive from Commodore would have actually cost. And if anyone knows or remembers the price, please leave a message in the comments. Anyway, I hope you found this interesting. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you.